How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good. <laughs> I'm sure it's, uh, it must be very hard to listen again at four o'clock in an afternoon like this. So if I notice anybody dozing off, I know it's not the speaker, it's the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> What do you normally do at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday? Oh, I'd, I'd just be coming out of the prisons now. I spend my Saturday up in the prisons. So I'd normally just be leaving the prison now okay. and, uh, and, and going home for a while. So this is Father Peter McVeary. Um, um, you might have heard of him um, for many reasons. Uh, in the press, on television, <clears throat> in the radio. Um, uh, his work uh, with the Peter McVeary Trust uh, has highlighted homelessness in Ireland and, and brought not just a highlight, but has brought such change to the area of homelessness that it's kind of radical, it's changed the way that Ireland thinks of homelessness, I guess I could say that. Is that true? Well, it may have done that, but <laughs> the problem of homelessness just keeps spiraling up and up and up. So I can't honestly say we've been very successful. Okay. Well, out of curiosity, what would success look like in the area of homelessness? Success means that we go out of business yeah. because there is no homelessness anymore. That would be success. So our objective is to become redundant. Okay. Because homelessness is a basic right for people. Uh, and a basic right should be provided uh, through the, the laws and constitution of a society and should be given to people through the structures of a society. So to have a home shouldn't depend on charities. It shouldn't depend on fundraising. It should be guaranteed to every single person in a Christian, civilized society. What would you do with yourself if you went redundant? Oh, Take up uh, <laughs> Walk me, dog. <laughs> he arrived with a little puppy, a little Jack Russell. Uh, gorgeous little puppy. So tell me, um, you tweet, right? No, I don't. I'm too old for that. You have people, <laughs> you have people who tweet for you? Yeah, the, okay. yeah, the organization does. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Good. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to ask you a question that you maybe have never done before. If you were to tweet who, if, so the answer, if I were to ask the question, who is Peter McVeary? Oh, and you had a tweet good. length answer, you know, okay. 140 characters, okay. so it's short. Who is Peter McVeary in your words? Hey, Peter McVeary used to be an angry young man, but then I changed and I became an angry old man. <laughs> <laughs> You should tweet more. Um, same question. What do you think others tweet about you when they ask the question, who's Peter McVeary? What would others tweet? It depends on who the others are. Uh, the greatest compliment I get is from homeless people or people in prison who tell me, they say, thanks. Thanks for speaking up for us because they feel nobody, nobody does, you mm. know? Uh, and I really appreciate that more than, than anything else. If you ask the powers that be, those in authority, uh, who is Peter McVeary, they'd say he's the biggest pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> that would fit perfectly in a tweet as well. <laughs> Peter McVeary, biggest pain in the ass. Um, so are you a priest or an activist? I'm both. Uh, I, I'm a priest who became an activist, and an activist who sees his role as a priest as very central to his activism. Uh, for me, uh, I, uh, my faith, my faith in God and in Jesus Christ, uh, but the link for me between faith and justice is the concept of dignity, okay. that every single human being has the dignity of being a child of God. And therefore, if I get up on a Sunday in the pulpit and preach about the dignity of every single human being, if I'm not working the rest of the week to make that dignity a reality in the lives of people whose dignity has been taken away, then what I say in the pulpit on a Sunday morning is just empty words. Yeah. So struggling to affirm the dignity of people is, is, is what I, I, I try to do, uh, and it is what, uh, it's at the core of, of, of my faith. Uh. And as an as a angry young man growing up, did you... Did you think you'd ever grow up to be someone who advocated on behalf of others? No, I never planned anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Including I this became, interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> I went to, when I was 30 years of age, I went to live in the, uh, in the inner city of Dublin. Uh, and that's where I became radicalized. Uh, and I became angry. I became angry at the housing conditions that people lived in, uh, which were appalling, and uh, at how that shaped the rest of their lives. 
You had kids there who would be up half the night because their parents were fighting, or the parents in the flat underneath were fighting, and you could hear every word they were saying. You had kids who were leaving school at the very latest by the age of 12. They were, their parents were unemployed, couldn't give them any money. So what were they doing? A little bit of robbing. And by the time they got to 16 and 17, they were doing an awful lot of robbing and going to prison. And it was as predictable as day follows night. So I became, that's when I became angry. And I said, no, I want to, uh, to do something about this. And then I came across a kid sleeping on the street, nine years of age. So we said, gosh, we'd better do something for, for kids like this. So we opened a small little hostel. I thought no more of it. Uh, I said, well, I'll run this for a couple of years and then I'll go off and do something else. Uh, so I ran that for a couple of years and then the kids were leaving that at 16, 16 and a half. They were growing out of it and they were going back on the street. So we opened the hostel for the over 16. And then as 16 year olds tend to do, they became 18. <laughs> and we opened the hostel for the over 18s and then we had to open more hostels because the numbers were growing. Then the drug problem hit Dublin, so we had to open a drug uh, detox centre. So one thing just led to another. And as I say, I never planned any of my life. One thing just led to another and ended up looking back, spending 40 years of my life doing this. I mean, but we all walk, we all see homeless people on the streets. We all, we all understand the housing crisis. We, yeah. we understand, you know, the fights that take place mm. to keep kids awake at night and the drug problem that exists in Ireland. But what in yourself, Peter, like, what do you think drove you drove that passion beyond or into action? See, when I was in Dublin, uh, I walked through the inner city many a time. Uh, but it's easy to I ignore. looked at it. I, I, knew the, I knew the conditions were bad. I saw the kids robbing. But it was only when I went and lived there and experienced it okay. that uh, it became a, a real re reality for me. Uh, so I think it can become... Uh, it, I think a lot of these problems are... Uh, the problems that we acknowledge, yeah. but until we actually engage with the problem, it doesn't become a passion for us. Yeah. Uh, in other words, we have, we have kids who come into our drop-in centre for homeless people, spend a week there, and it has a huge impact on them. And what impacts on them is that they actually meet homeless people. They speak to them, they listen to them, they get behind the label, homeless person, drug addict, and they meet the real person. And they discover the real person is exactly the same as them, but their path in life has gone in a very different direction through no fault of their own. One young lad wrote, wrote a terrific report after it, and he said, you know, uh, I came in here, I was terrified coming in, he said. I didn't know what was going to happen. I sat down, I saw all these fellas with, with sleeping bags under their arms and torn jeans. And uh, Anyway, I just sat down uh, very nervous and then one of these guys came over to me and he stood over me and he looked down at me and I felt like running out of the place and the homeless guy said to him would you like a cup of tea <laughs> 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 and he told me that changed everything and he then he said in that week I became a socialist <laughs> I said we got to tax the rich more we can't have people living like this we got to provide better services uh, so it's when you actually engage with the problem and when you actually encounter people who are experiencing the hardships and sufferings that the problem uh, creates for them, that uh, that's where the passion comes but from. But we're so good at ignoring it. How do you keep engaged well, in that? Well, I keep engaged because I'm meeting homeless people every day. Okay. Uh, I mean, most of my day I'm surrounded by homeless people and I hear their stories. Yeah, yeah. And I hear the stories of how they've been left out three nights in a row. They come in soaking wet. Uh, they ring up looking for a bed at half at two o'clock in the day. Uh, and they're left waiting on the phone for an hour and a quarter before they get to speak to somebody who will then tell them there's no beds left and they're totally frustrated. So that's, that's what keeps you going. Uh, and how long have you been ordained for? So ordained in 1975. 1975. Why did you Almost become ordained? ordained? Uh, I, I became ordained because I w felt I wanted my life to be of service to other people. Where did that come from? I think it came from my father. My father was a doctor. Uh, we grew up in Newry, a small little provincial town. Uh, my father was a doctor. And in those days, you didn't have practices. You were a doctor and you had your patients. And uh, if a call came in the middle of the night, you didn't have, uh, you didn't have fellow doctors who could do a week for you or do a week. So if a call came in the middle of the night, you went out to it. So I would frequently as a child 
hear the phone going, my father getting up in the middle of the night, going off to visit his patients. Sometimes the phone would go twice in the night, and he'd get up, and never, ever a word of complaint. And uh, there was a great sense there of service. Yeah. Uh, that's what he was for. I think I got a sense of service from him. From him. So I wanted my life always going through school. I wanted my life to be of, of service to other people. And in those days, in the 1960s, when I was leaving school, becoming a priest was a way of doing that. Yeah. Uh, and it was a valued way of doing that and a respectable way of doing that. Uh, so I, I sort of drifted into the priesthood <laughs> Tell me, like, and never looked back. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're a Catholic priest. What order yeah. is it? Jesuits. Jesuits. Um, good group. Well done. I think they're a good, <laughs> I think they're a good group. Uh, are we, have we moved into a post-Catholic or even a post-traditional Ireland? We've moved into a post-institutional religion Ireland. People are switched off the institutional religion. Uh, they, I think people, and the homeless people too, uh, have still got a very strong sense of God and still a very strong sense of an afterlife. If there's a funeral, gosh, people, will, they will turn up to a funeral. It's not a social occasion, just it's a religious occasion. They really do believe this person has gone to a better place. They really will pray for them. So there is, I think, a still a very strong sense of faith, but it's not expressed in the institutional forms that we have in Ireland today. And I can understand that. Uh, you know, particularly Catholic Church uh, has, I think, for far too long proclaimed a God of the law, a God who lays down laws, and you've got to obey all these laws, and if you obey all these laws, you'll be rewarded with a place in heaven, and if you don't obey them, you'll be... Uh, somehow condemned, you may end up in hell or somewhere. Uh, we preached a God of the law, and a God of the law is essentially a God who judges, who judges by whether you keep the law or you don't keep the law. Young people today are not in the slightest bit interested in a God who judges them, not in the slightest bit interested. And I agree with them. Uh, they are searching for a God of compassion. They are searching for a God who cares, and they're being fed a God of the law. So and so I think what Pope Francis is doing is bringing us back to the God of compassion. That is the God of the Gospels. Uh, you know, isn't it interesting that when Jesus was around, thousands of people followed him to listen to him, spent the whole day listening to him. Uh, they were absolutely uh, enthralled by what he was saying. Uh, and they didn't come to listen to Jesus laying down laws or reaffirming old laws. They came to listen to Jesus because Jesus was talking about a God who cared for them. Uh, and I think people are walking away from institutional religion today because institutional churches are proclaimed, particularly the Catholic Church, have been preaching a God of the law, and they're not interested. Pope Francis is leading us back to a God of compassion, both by what he says and he does. And isn't it interesting? Thousands of people are following him. Mass in Rio, three million people turned up. Mass in Manila, six million people turned up. So I think when we proclaim the real God, the God of the gospel, the God of compassion, people will listen. And if people are walking away, we have to ask ourselves, what God are we proclaiming? A couple of quick questions just on, um, in the Catholic Church in particular, there's maybe not a, such an emphasis, even though there is a huge uh, amount of women involved with ministry. What is your views on women in ministry? I think all roles within the Catholic Church should be open to women just as much as men. Now, the traditional reason is Jesus only selected men as his, uh, as his apostles, but the times were different. Uh, in those days, uh, women's role was a very, very different role uh, to what it is today. And I think it would have just probably complicated Jesus' whole mission and ministry and message uh, women would complicate him. <laughs> women always complicate him. No, the, yeah. the role that... Uh, but I think today we are aware today, as we never could have been in the past, that of gender equality as, a, as an issue of justice. And I think the church has to take that on board. Gender equality was not an issue uh, at the time of Jesus. They would have thought it was absolutely mad. In fact, up to not so re up to quite recently, people thought it was mad. Women didn't have the vote when they wanted to get a vote. People absolutely strenuously opposed women having the vote. So it's only in the last century or so that 
gender equality, we see as a basic justice issue, and I think the church has to take that on board and open all roles to male and female. Would, would you say the similar thing about lay, lay ministry, non-ordained ministry? I would say even more. We can't depend on priests because uh, the, uh, the, the church... The, the church is essential. 99.999% of the church are lay people. <laughs> and therefore, they, should, they are the church. And therefore, uh, they should have the 99.99% the say in the, in, in the role of the church and the running of the church. And so, yeah, I think the church should essentially be a, a church made up of lay people where the priest has a particular role to play within that but not a, com not a controlling role. And it's interesting where the church is very alive, such as in Africa uh, and that. It's, it, the church is run by lay people. The priest just comes in and says the mass, but the whole thing and the baptisms, preparation, well, everything is organized by lay people. And you have a vibrant uh, uh, church and you have vibrant liturgies uh, because the whole thing is, 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 is run by lay people. What angers Peter McVeary? Well, I get angry at uh, the way people are treated, homeless people are treated, the way people in prison are treated, the way people leaving prison are treated. I get angry at uh, when we marginalize people and write them off, and when we look down on people and, uh, and tell them that they're second class. Uh, I get angry because Many of my friends are homeless people. At this stage, I have built up strong relationships with, with many homeless people. Uh, and I get angry when I see that the way they are treated by society. For me, love and anger are two sides of the one coin. That you can't love somebody who is suffering unnecessarily without being angry at what's causing the suffering. So for me, anger is a positive. Now, it can be expressed negatively. It can explode destructively. But basically, anger is a very positive uh, uh, feeling, which, if it is channeled constructively, uh, can be very powerful in bringing about change. What, 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 where does Peter McVeary find joy? Uh, how do I find joy? Uh, I find joy in when the little that you can do for homeless people means so much to them. And when homeless people come to me and they say, thanks very much for something I said or something I did, and I can't even remember what I said or did, <laughs> but they said it had a huge impact on me, it, was, uh, it, it, uh, it really made me think or it changed my life or something, um, I, I, really, uh, I really value that. Yeah. So often, and more and more these days, homeless people come in to me and I can't solve their problem. They come in, they're looking for accommodation, and I say there is no accommodation. It's all full, I'm sorry. Or they're looking for drug treatment tomorrow, and I say, look, there's a six-month waiting list, I'm sorry. Uh, but they'll often go away saying, well, thanks anyway for listening to me. You know, the very fact that you took the time to listen meant a lot to them. And so that, that, gives, me great, uh, that gives me joy, and it gives me a great personal belief that what I'm doing is, is worthwhile and what I'm doing is what God wants me to do at this particular point in my life. And where do you find God? Like, how, how, do, how do you I pray? Find, well, my, uh, one of the things homeless people have taught me is to be very grateful for what I've received. I mean, I grew up in a good home. My parents cared for me, did their best for me, got me the best education they could get for me, could have had a good job if I hadn't joined the Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so life has been very, very good to me. And so um, God for me is no longer the judge. Uh, I grew up thinking God was a judge. You had to be very careful. You had to be doing all these things. Uh, I thought God was a judge. And I remember uh, shortly after joining the Jesuits, this is what the Jesuits do to you. <laughs> I woke up one Sunday morning and I said, I'm not going to Mass today. And uh, I didn't go to Mass today. And, you know, uh, I woke up Monday morning, and surprise, surprise, I wasn't in hell. <laughs> so after that, after that, I went to Mass because I wanted to go to Mass, not because somebody, even a God, was telling me I had to go to Mass. So uh, where was I coming from? Uh, 
be. Where do you find God? How yeah. So my prayer now to God is just thanks. Thank thanks you. for what I have received, because I have received and continue to receive so very, very much. So the God who is a judge, I have rejected. And for me now, God is the giver of the gifts. And I have received so many gifts from God. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, I just, I just say thanks. And as far as participation goes, I know a lot of times we talk to a lot of uh, young adults, but lots of different age groups actually, who say they want to get involved, they want to see change, they want to be, not just see change, they want to participate yeah, in change. Yeah. They don't just want to talk about it, they want to get out and do right. something. How do, we, how do we get involved? Because that, cause there's nothing more frustrating than wanting to be involved, but then not having an opportunity to be involved. How do we get involved in actually bringing about this change in the areas that you're talking about? Well, I think the churches uh, have a real role in helping young people to see that their desire to change things for the better of their fellow human beings is at the very heart of the ministry of Jesus, the very heart of the mission of Jesus, and the very heart... Uh, of what the church is, is all about. For me, one of the things in the Gospels, uh, you know, the, 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 the religious authorities at the time of Jesus believed that God was to be found in the temple, in the Holy of Holies in the temple. That's where you found God. That's where God lived. And Jesus came along and he said, I'll destroy this temple. And for Jesus, uh, God was not to be found in a temple. God was to be found in other human beings. I was hungry and you gave me to eat. So for me, God is to be found in other human beings and particularly in those who are suffering and struggling and experiencing hardship. And I think we have got to, instead of in the Catholic Church, we want to get our young people into church, we want to get them into Mass, uh, but I think we have to uh, help them to understand that their care for others is what Christianity, the Gospels, and the Church is fundamentally all about. And the sacraments and the Eucharist uh, are, are, are a part of that. They are there to help us mm -hmm. care for others. They're missional but tools. if they're not helping us to care better for others, we're wasting our time. Mm. We're wasting our time going to the Eucharist, going to the sacraments, if they're not helping us to make us more caring and more active uh, in caring for, uh, for, for others. So, you know, parents often come to me and they say, look, I'm really worried about my son or daughter. They don't go to Mass anymore. And I say, what is it like? Oh, they're really very good people. They'd do anything for anybody. You know, and if you ask them to go out on a soup run or you ask them to do, do you know, they'd jump at the idea. I said, you have nothing to worry about. God has not abandoned them and they have not abandoned God. You know, sometimes young people say to me, how do you know there's a God? I say, I'll tell you how to know there's a God. Imagine sitting at a, at a river uh, on a lovely sunny day and you're enjoying the peace and the, the, the quiet. There's a little child playing on the bank beside you, the river bank. And the next minute the child falls into the, uh, into the river. So you jump in, you pull the little child out, you revive, you save their life. What will the parents of that child do? Well, the first thing the parents will do is go to the hospital or wherever and make sure their child is all right. What's the next thing they'll do? The next thing they'll do is they will want to find that man because they will want to thank him personally for saving their child's life. So I say to young people, you want to know if there's a God, look around you. Look around at the suffering and the hardship that people are experiencing. <coughs> Reach out and do something about that. Try and take some of that suffering off their shoulders. They are the children of God. What will God do? God will want to find you because God will want to thank you personally for what you have done for God's children. And when God finds you, then you will meet God and then you will know that God exists. And how will you know that God exists? Because when you reach out to God's children in trying to deal with the suffering on their shoulders, you will experience the Spirit. You will experience huge joy, a very, very deep peace, a very, very deep sense of contentment, a deep uh, feeling that what you are doing is, is, is the right thing to do. You will experience all what we would call the gifts of the Spirit. And when you experience the gifts of the Spirit, then God is living in you, and you know that you have met God. And tell me, if people want to get involved with the, the work of the Peter McVeary Trust or donate to it, 
Is it just is it going online? Is it uh... well? The easy way is to go online. We have a website. If you Google my name, you'll get the uh, the, the the website is pmvtrust.ie. But if you just Google my name, you'll uh, you'll get onto the the website. You can. There's a section there for volunteering. There's a section there for donating. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, that's the easiest way to do it. Last mm -hmm. question. Um, you were may you were, you were awarded the Irish Freedom of the City recently, correct? Freedom of Dublin, yes. Freedom of Dublin, okay. Yeah. Freedom of Dublin, meaning that you can graze sheep on Stephen's Green. That's about all you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Are you tempted? I made a joke. <laughs> I made a joke at the ceremony saying, you know, you get nothing for this. You think they'd at least give you free parking, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, it's so, all <laughs> The clamping company wrote to me, <laughs> said, we heard what you said, we'll give you free parking. <laughs> <laughs> so, amazing, amazing. Well, on that note, it's been a huge honor once again. Please put your hands together for Father Peter McVeary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.